Hi everybody, Jeff Simon here for Social Flight and today we have another very cool stage of building on our Titan T51D Mustang. We're going to talk about the center pedestal. This is an area in between the pilot's legs just below the uh, instrument panel that we showed in our last video. Uh, this goes directly below the glove box and has a number of instruments that we're going to use and also the lighting control that we're going to also have for our panel. And so a lot to dive into here that I'd like to fill you in on and give you some uh, information about how we did it and how this might also apply to your own aircraft. Um, the gauges that we're using here are from UMA. I absolutely love these things. They're fantastic. They're these small uh, 1.25 inch gauges. That's an example of one uh, right there that you can see. Uh, electronic in nature on the back of it is this uh, DB9 connector. Very compact very lightweight and you know in some cases I just love having analog gauges as well. You may uh, wonder why we would have gauges when we also have an engine monitor. As we talked about in the last video, one of the challenges of having automotive conversion, or even if your aircraft has a Rotax on it, is that most engine monitors are not actually designed for automotive or water-cooled engines. And so they're set up for the kind of that traditional EGT, CHT engine management. But it does have tons of other things that we need. So our engine monitor in the Mustang handles the manifold pressure, the RPM, and a slew of other numbers that we're going to need for fuel flow, for planning to our destination, as well as a number of uh, indications for temperature of like oil pressure, oil temperature, things like that. However, we wanted to be able to use this, uh, the analog gauges in the center to handle some other parts of things, which in our case includes left and right fuel quantity, as well as what's happening during our fuel transfer. So let's talk about that for a minute. In the Mustang, we have a left and right tank in the center section that feed into a sump tank that drives everything for directly gets pulled uh, for the engine itself by fuel pumps. Now we have a one of the reserves that we have, one of the backup tanks, is actually in the turtle deck. And we showed in a previous video how we pump and, uh, pressurized fuel out of that and refill our mains uh, through that system basically uh, when they burn down to a certain level. And we wanted to be able to, to see that happen, we wanted to actually know that pressure was happening and know when we ran out, basically, when the tank went dry. One of the things that we looked at doing for that is to actually measure the pressure in that line as, it, as it's actually filling. So um, we're using that as kind of our uh, first stop for doing it. Um, having a fuel flow transducer is a little bit overkill to actually, if you just want to see is fuel still flowing, um, because there's a lot more to it with a flow transducer. So in our case, we're using pressure. And that's what we're putting in between the left and right fuel tank measurements for quantity, is when we switch on our transfer pump, we're going to watch pressure and know when that actually uh, changes over. So that's our three top gauges here. Next, we have our water measurement ones, and we have water temperature and water pressure. And then the last one here over to the right on the bottom is our hydraulic pressure, because the landing gear system on the Mustang is hydraulic, and this will make sure that we know that we have proper pressure in the system and can monitor it. So those are our six kind of mini instruments right there in our center pedestal, right in front of the pilot, very easy to see. And again, I love these UMA gauges. Let's talk for a bit about how gauges work because that'll help you if you ever have to debug something even in your general aviation aircraft, even as a certified aircraft. There's basically two different types of, uh, uh, of key areas for uh, how gauges and sensors work when you're dealing with this. Even though this is electronic, it's uh, you know, electro-analog in that it has a moving uh, instrument as well, uh, a moving needle. And so um, the first type is based on variable resistance. And that's how the fuel quantity uh, gauges these instruments work here. What they do is they sense a variable resistance based on a float in the fuel tank. And as the float moves, it moves along a potentiometer, which is a variable resistor, and then outputs a different voltage based on that, or actually the system is seeing a resistance, is actually measuring a resistance, didn't want to misspeak with the voltage. And so 
This is the fuel gauge. We, uh, there's a special video talking just about this, but this is the fuel gauge for this. And um, if I go and let me actually hook this up to this, I can uh, demonstrate it for you. A little quick twist, get this hooked up. And what, what I can see here as I actually move this, this is its empty position. And you can see this instrument is actually measuring empty now. As the float comes up, it'll reach its midpoint. That's our half full. And then keep going as we go up till it gets all the way to full. Now this particular gauge goes from zero to 90 ohms. And that gives you, that's your measure of resistance. At zero, when it's at zero, it's, uh, back, it's at empty. When it's at 90, it's at full. And if you're ever debugging or trying to find a problem with your aircraft's uh, fuel level system, chances are you probably have a system that works similar to this, where you can actually go to the tank, we can see where the level sensor is, if it's a float-based system, and you can actually measure what is the resistance and compare that to what the book tells you the resistances sh should be at zero, at half a tank, at full tank, etc. So it's a good thing to know, and some aircraft, um, like our Bonanza, for example, even has two separate um, fuel sensors in a single tank because the tank is at an angle, and that allows you to kind of, uh, they're, they're put together in series, meaning additive. So you add the two resistances together. So the first one on the inside of the tank, since the tank is at an angle, uh, when it's full, both of those floats are all the way up. As it starts to go down, the outer one goes down to zero, but you still have the resistance of the next one, which then goes down. There's some overlap, but the bottom line is you're left there with being able to see this total resistance level go all the way back down to zero. Good point if you need to troubleshoot that. So that's how this works in hours. And we've got this all kind of set up and working, uh, ready to put into the plane. Now, another type of system that uses these gauges as well uh, is similar for things like a pressure sensor, like this pressure transducer. This is a pressure transducer from UMA. I'll have you take a look at that. And this is something really good because you can use it for water pressure, hydraulic pressure, fuel pressure. Um, and uh, it has a very, you probably can't see it through the video, but there's a tiny little hole that goes through here to the pressure, the actual sensor inside. And then you have essentially three wires coming out of this. You have a plus, a ground, a positive power, a ground, and then a signal wire. And in this case, the signal wire is sending out uh, milliamps. It's giving you a from like 4 to 20 milliamps, which is a measure of current. That current is coming out and is going to give us, in this case, our water pressure measurement. Um, this can be used for uh, a number of different types of sensors. But again, uh, there are some sensors that are going to be sending out resistance. There's some sensors that are going to send out a variable voltage. There's some sensors that are going to send out a variable amperage. And that all is simply based on matching the sensor to the instrument. UMA does all this for you. They have all this if that's something that you're interested in doing on your own uh, aircraft. Um, I, again, we're going to be able to mark, uh, put markings on these for like what a red zone is, what's in green, things like that. But we've got all this in place. And, uh, and ready to go. And I just love the fact that it's all, it's all simple and it's all modular and it can go right into the uh, center point there. Now, let's talk about lighting. Um, lighting, it, when you're dealing with uh, avionics and with your panel lighting, uh, there's so many options there that uh, it can be a little bit you know, overwhelming to decide what you wanna do. Now, the first thing, is that many instruments, including the ones in our panel uh, from uh, companies like, like Aspen and Avidyne, L3 Harris, U Avionics, um, RC Allen, there's uh, so many instruments that we have there that have their own uh, sensor. They have their own light sensor, in many cases built into the instrument so that it can do its own internal lighting decision-making based on ambient light. Now, the, uh, there are two other ways that lighting can happen. One of them is uh, a simple kind of on off and that is our trim indication that we have uh, in the system. That has a sensor that's just on or off. Either if it sees voltage, 
then it assumes that like your your you see voltage uh, that's like a switch to say like say panel lights on then it wants to dim and so in one case we need to turn down our indicator lights by applying voltage to a signal line and in another case it can be variable which many of the avionics we have allow you to have a variable line and that can actually lower the avionics brightness based on it's kind of inverse is the way they do it they assume like the old style you've got post lights or something like that and as you turn up your post lights which makes them brighter more voltage that it wants to watch that and then as it sees that goes up then its bezel lights or the lights it's using for the LCD display goes down. And that's how those work. They have a sensor that they align to see what you're doing with your panel lights. So in our case, we, that, that covers what you're doing for your avionics, but then you also have to think about glare shield lighting, ambient lighting, map lighting, things like that. And so what we decided to do is we decided to use the avionics themselves for their own internal dimming based on amb ambient light. We decided to be have adjustable light based on a glare shield, adjustable light for a map light, and then we had to have an on-off switch that basically will dim everything else that looks just for an on or off for its dimming. And so here's how we actually did that. The first is, we have this switch right in the center, and that's just a push, click on and off. That's gonna route straight to our trim system and our trim indicators. When it sees voltage, all those are gonna trim down. So that's the first thing that's gonna happen. Next, we have these, tr these two adjustable uh, 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 potentiometers, which are gonna control lighting. Now, one of the challenges that happens is a lot of lighting now, if not all, if you should be building something new, it's going to be with LEDs. And many LEDs, uh, first of all, you have to make sure you select LEDs that are dimmable. You have to make sure they're dimmable. Then the second thing is you have to control them with a dimmer that is designed to control LEDs. LEDs, because they are light emitting diodes, they are generally they like the concept of on and off and they don't like as much lower lower voltages that doesn't really work well with a digital thing like a light emitting diode so there are these controllers that we got off ebay you can see this uh, very small little block controllers down here these are called pulse width modulation and what that does is if you can imagine you have zero no voltage and then you have full voltage which in our aircraft is 14 volts so you have zero you have 14 they're either on or they're off what they do with this pulse width modulation is do they start breaking it up like on off on off on off and depending on the width of when it's on your eyes don't see the pulsing but you can imagine it between that that the smaller the pulse the bigger the gap the dimmer the light is going to actually appear to you. If you think of this in terms of like a motor, when you go and you apply a power to an electric motor, it starts to spin up. It doesn't immediately start at full power. And if you remove it, it starts to slow down. If you were to attach the, the power to an electric motor and then remove it before it got too fast and then attach it again and remove it, the speed at which you decided to put those pulses and the time that it actually had at full power versus without full power would translate into an amount of time or a speed of the motor because of the power it's getting. We're doing the same thing with lighting. We're controlling the width of power pulses and the width of gaps of no power going to the LEDs and that's controlling how bright it is. So let's show you what that translates into. Um, let's start here. We have these strip lights, which uh, are what we're actually going to be using under our glare shield. And if I go up to full power here, you can see these, uh, these strip lights are great. I absolutely love them. Um, did a, we've done a lot of experimenting to see how it looks in the dark, uh, whether we can see any, uh, any pulsing or anything like that, how smooth the light is. What's nice is that they're also trimmable. So you can go to certain points on it where they're meant to be cut, and then you can use that length along your glare shield, underneath, etc. And by using this pulse width modulation, we can then start 
uh, controlling it, it's getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer now as I turn it down because those pulses are getting less and less and then there's a click and it actually stops. The next thing I'd like to show here is, I, I love this little thing. This is a small uh, like eyeball light that we have from Whelan Aviation Technologies, WAT. Uh, Whelan has uh, supplied uh, many of the lights that we're using on the aircraft. Uh, we use them on the Bonanza, absolutely love their products. And this thing is so well made. It is CNC machined out of aluminum, um, very, very high quality. A, a long time ago, we took a look at something that we found on Amazon that kind of looked similar, and it was terrible. It was just you know plastic, it didn't hold together, uh, nothing really worked right. Once we got these from Wheeland, they are just astounding. And this will show you how this actually works. If we go and turn this on, you can just now begin to see the light coming on, and now you can see the light from it shining up there, and then I can turn this down, and you can see it dim and go out. And so this eyeball light is going to be great because we're going to have a kneeboard, cramped quarters, and we can just aim it straight at the kneeboard. And all of it is controlled right here from our instrument and lighting control in the center console of our Titan T51D Mustang. Let's take a look at the installation in our T51D Mustang. All right, well, that is another cool stage of building in our Titan T51D Mustang. As you saw, this just fits right into place, looks fantastic. I couldn't be happier. So be sure to check out socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps for Apple and Android devices. We have tens of thousands of aviation events and destinations. It gets you out there and flying. You can find out what's happening near you. We also have our Social Flight live show every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific time with amazing guests, just some of the most wonderful people in general aviation. And also, if you have the mobile app on your phone, you can check in at local airports and compete in our fly to win challenge. We are always giving away amazing prizes from our partners here at Social Flight. Until next time, I wish you all blue skies.